Hi everyone, welcome back for this week's um, podcast. Once again, I'm joined by uh, Graham. Well, actually, this might be the first time he's on the podcast, but um, Graham, my colleague uh, here in the Department of Anesthesia, has joined me, and we're going to talk about diabetic uh, ketoacidosis in pregnancy. How are you, Roger? So, um, Graham, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, so I have a, uh, a vested interest in this. So, this is a picture of my cat, who's um, 15 years old now. He uh, he had a uh, DKA crisis five years ago, cost me three and a half thousand dollars, and uh, was his first presentation of diabetes. Prior to that, we didn't know he had diabetes. Um, so DKA is a very common present, uh, very common presentation of um, the initial diagnosis of diabetes. And um, so, you know, for the last five and a half years, I've had to uh, inject uh, Lantus or long, uh, long-acting insulin to a scruff of his neck twice a day, every time we give him a can of. Um, Pet food. Uh, yeah, I've only treated one cat in my life, and again, <laughs> I uh, injected. Actually, I injected glucocorticoids for its um, its um, uh, uh, airway sense. reactivity condition. So it had a bit of asthma. Didn't it? it did. Yep. Anyway, we won't bore the listeners. So suffice it to say that three and a half to four thousand dollars after uh, later is DKA resolved, and uh, he's still going strong. Okay, so I thought today's talk we will we'll base it around a hypothetical case. So this is not, not a real case, but it sort of sounds very familiar, I'm sure. So let's um, pretend we have a 32-year-old woman with known diabetes who um, lives out in the bush, out in Wulpup, in regional WA. And she presents to a hospital there in preterm labour um, at 27 weeks. And, they, and she's a bit febrile and they think she might have chorioamnionitis, so she's an infection brewing. They give her some... Um, Nifedafine for tocolysis, tocolysis, some celestone, which is intramuscular betamethasone, mm. um, a steroid. We'll talk about that in a minute, and that might have some re- uh, implications. And she's transferred, and as they do sometimes, I know they sometimes run cell butamol infusions for tocolysis when they're nervous. Um, if I was an RFDS pilot, I definitely wouldn't want a 27-week-old baby accidentally plopping out on the trolley uh, mid-flight. So you can understand why they are um, super keen to prevent any further contractions. Do you know anyway, if she's had any antibiotics, Roger? Um, I just wrote this uh, on the spur of the moment, but I presume they would give her some antibiotics. Yeah, let's just chuck that in there for for um, completion. So let's just pretend that when she finally arrives at your hospital, you're, you're a, um, perhaps a receiving centre, um, she is short of breath, tachypneic. Her sets are okay, though, uh, and she is febrile. So. I bet she's tachycardic as well. In my yep. experience working for the Royal Flying Doctor Service in WA, uh, that was definitely one of the side effects of salbutamol yes, infusion. Yes, I have seen. I have seen a few of them when they arrived, and um, you know, salbutamol, as we all know, can cause um, tachycardia. All right, so Graham, I'm going to put Graham on the spot, mm-hmm. but he's helped me write a few um, tutorials on blood gases recently, so we, um, I'm expecting some big things from you, Graham. Okay. So let's pretend uh, the. Um, the um, very diligent team have done a blood gas on when she arrives because they're a bit worried about her, as yeah. well as a number of other tests, but let's just focus on this. So, so you want to interpret that? So obviously the most important thing is the patient. It's a pregnant woman, and uh, it sounds like she looks sick. Um, so uh, going through the blood gas rules, the pH, she's got an acidemia. The PCO2 is very low, so on top yep. of her... Um, respiratory alkalosis from being pregnant she's got um, some more respiratory alkalosis her bicarb is very low so that implies there's a metabolic problem a metabolic acidemia with uh, incomplete um, respiratory compensation exactly right and then we'll go through the um, anion gap uh, sodium minus uh, the concentration of sodium minus the concentration of bicarb plus, uh, am I missing? Chloride. Chloride, yep. yep. Here, there you go. So that's 108. So it's an uh, anion gap of 28. So yep. she's got a, a high anion. Uh, that's right, high anion, anion gap. gap. metabolic yeah, acidosis. Exactly. So, mm. yeah, so normal anion gap is 8 to 16 if you use the, so- the sodium only formula. So 28 is pretty high. And what do you think uh, she's got? She's probably got uh, ketoacidosis. Exactly. As a she's got a high glucose and she's a known type 1 diabetic, so um, no stars for figuring that one out. And also the urinalysis is indicative of um, ketones and glucose. Yep. So, And with so sepsis, she may also have a raised lactate, so it may be multifactorial. Yep, But um, exactly. So she could have um, uh, lactic acidosis as well. And mm-hmm. most blood gas machines will measure the lactate, so um, I haven't chucked that in here, but we, that should be um, available. Okay, so before we get on to the management 
we're going to revise a little bit of physiology and um, basic physiology of what ketones are. And you know, it's all the rage at the moment. I don't know about you, um, but everyone seems to be having uh, low carb keto diets. Um, so there's certainly um, a lot of stuff around about that. This is um, what's this guy's name? I think his name's right? Jonah Hill. Yep. And I didn't know he was as thin as he um, appears to be <laughs> no, in the right hand frame. It certainly frame. looks like the keto diet has worked for him. Mm. So what's the what are ketones? So I'm just going to run through this and Graham can interrupt me. But basically, norm, normal physiology. So normally, um, when we're not fasting, most of our meals involve a, um, a rel relative amount of carbohydrate, unless we're on the keto diet. But most of us ingest some carbohydrate regularly. Um, and so we use that, uh, that to, the glucose directly from your gut goes into your bloodstream to fuel your brain and your body. And of course you can store excess glucose as glycogen, which can then be released um, over the ensuing. Usually I think um, if you fast, it probably takes uh, 12 to 18 hours before you run out of glycogen. So normally you can sort of make your own or, or release your own glucose pretty well up until about 18 hours. Yeah, no, I was, fasting. Is of that course, right? Does that sound about right? Yeah. That is correct. Of course, you can also store your excess glucose as fat, yeah. um, as a longer-term store of fat, yeah. and you can also deplete your glycogen a little quicker if you exercise. And the classic right, yeah. example is the marathon runner who... One k out hits from the wall. one that's k right. out from the end of the race hits the wall. Yeah, because and that's why you'll see a lot of people. Um, you know, uh, for example, um, triathletes, uh, t cyclists in the Tour de France, they're all sucking back. Um, energy gels which are basically a lot of the time I think it's just like li liquefied glucose mm. sort of gel yeah to try and prevent that um, occurring so what happens when we're fast you know we don't all drop dead so I, I guess one of the main things about um, glucose is that um, it is the preferred fuel of most of the body because I think it's the easiest thing to be to turn into ATP but when we're low on glucose um, we turn to other alternative um, fuels and the mitochondria in our body um, can use um, fatty acids or lipolysis um, and the another another thing they can use is ketones which are manufactured from fatty acids so one of the main uh, things to realize is that the brain the, the human brain is um, glucose dependent so it always needs some glucose that's why we have to maintain our glucose levels above about three otherwise we um, become unconscious don't think so well uh, but what but the brain can use some ketones but it can't can't use just ketones whereas other tissues in the body are quite happily cope without any glucose whatsoever um, um, apparently skeletal muscle and even the myocardium can use um, fatty acids and ketones alone yes. and cope quite well so it's really so the reason why we have to keep our glucose up is uh, just to maintain our brain function and um, all right so let's talk about um, the what other ketones so the, th the three ketones actually two of them are actual actually ketones I think acetone is a uh, some other chemical but these are the ones they talk about um, so, so acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate are the, are the keto acids in the body. I think acetone is a ketone, but it's not an acid. Um, so we'll talk about them in a, a little bit more. Um, so this is a complicated diagram, but basically what it shows is that fatty acids that come in, and you can see them at the top of the screen, fatty acids come into the mitochondria and become acetyl-CoA, and that can either be um, pumped through the Krebs cycle and turned into glucose, gluconeogenesis, so that's how you can turn fat into glucose, or they go down uh, the sort of hor um, vertical pathway there and get pumped out as ketones, so acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, we'll talk about that again in a second, but that's the process that occurs when um, when all the catabolic endocrine systems in your body are turned on, you know, the sympathetic nervous system, stress response, um, exercise, fa um, hypoglycemia, fasting, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think Does that sound right. That's correct. Any comments? No, explain that pretty that well. sounds yeah. so perfect. So what happens in DKA? So um, basically there's an, the really simplified uh, explanation is there's an imbalance in the insulin and the, which is the sort of um, anabolic um, hormone of the body, which turns, turns on glucose um, storage and the catabolic pro, um, processes or endocrine systems, which include things like glucagon, the um, adrenal steroids like cortisol, sympathetic nervous system like sympathomimetics and growth hormone, and there's a few others, aren't there? Well, there's one that's very important in pregnancy bones. called uh, human placental lactogen, yep. which structurally and functionally is very similar to growth hormone. And it's thought to be produced by the placenta in order to improve um, fuel availability for the fetus. 
Yep. And so that is why, I think we mentioned this in the next slide, that's why um, there is a predisposition to um, insulin resistance in pregnancy. And that's why, you know, the basis of gestational diabetes. And so some of the other things that are important to note when in a pregnant patient, so the, they have less of a buffer when they, if they do get an acidosis um, because they already have a pre-existing respiratory alkalosis. In other words, they already have a relative um, higher degree of hyperventilation. Their normal arterial CO2 is around 30 to 33, I think, whereas most of us who are not pregnant, um, it sits around 40. And so the kidney has compensated by allowing bicarb to be lost from the body. Yep. This is a relative <coughs> um, metabolic compensation for the chronic uh, respiratory alkalosis condition. That's right. Condition. Yep. And so we all talked about insulin resistance. And then um, I think there are, they also um, have um, increased tendency to lipolysis and f free fatty acid release, mm. probably because it's um, advantageous for, for the fetus. Mm. So what are the common triggers of um, DKA in a diabetic? First one, not using any insulin. That's right, yeah. So I think the three most common are first presentation of someone who didn't know they had diabetes. This is not just pregnancy, this is just in general. Um, but then the other ones are infections, which are obviously um, uh, common, and, um, and then the use of um, catabolic um, therapies like steroids and beta agonists, um, and just, uh, what else? Yeah, non-compliance, which you've already mentioned. There's a few other in there like starvation, insulin pumps failing, hyperemesis. I guess you're not absorbing um, food. And um, yeah, so those are all li the one commonly listed ones that I got from a article, which I'll mention at the end if, you wanna, if uh, people want to refer to that, which is um, about DK and pregnancy. And that hypothetical case that you showed earlier, Roger, <coughs> many of those uh, uh, triggers that's right. We're so she had, chorea, she had chorioamnionitis. She was given some intramuscular uh, corticosteroid. She was given some intravenous beta agonists, the cell butamol infusion. Um, and um, so those, that's three triggers, isn't it? Mm. And she's pregnant, so that's a four. Yep. Um, so this diagram just explains uh, it again. Um, interestingly, the more modern uh, understanding of DKA there is actually no problem with the tissues and the, and the skeletal muscle that are taking up glucose, so ignore that box on the left. But <clears throat> in trying to explain it in lay person's terms or simple terms is that basically it's the catabolic side of the um, process that gets turned on and just goes crazy. So what happens is um, there, once your insulin levels are below a certain amount, they, they can no longer inhibit their liver from... Um, going crazy and manufacturing ketones and glucose. Um, I'm not sure, I'll just flick ahead. So that will go back. And the best way of um, showing that is, um, yeah, back here on this slide. So, so once the, um, the inhibition of um, a certain amount of insulin is gone, then this process goes crazy. So even though there's plenty of glucose and the cells in the body are, are well, well fed and they're not... Um, uh, lacking in substrate, um, all of those triggers have caused um, a massive release of lipolysis, a massive release of fatty acids, and all those fatty acids have to go s somewhere, so the liver turns them into glucose and ketones. Yeah, I like to think of insulin as a little bit of a, uh, a, a hormone that stops the liver pumping out uh, energy substrates. So yep. uh, insulin stops Perfectly. the production of glucose, stops the production of ketones, and in the absence of insulin, the um, production of those two um, par or those two pathways is uncontrolled. That's right. And so classically, that's why um, insulin-dependent diabetics or type one diabetics um, are the ones that get DKA, whereas it's much less common in someone, say for example, who has type two or gestational diabetes, who does actually have some insulin, they just don't have enough. Um, Having said that, there are exceptions to every rule, and there are still people with gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes who can get DKA, but yes. it is definitely much more common in type 1 diabetics. All right, so what are the consequences, consequences of DKA, Graham? So the hyperglycemia. Patients get very um, unwell. Their blood sugar levels go up, and because they have very high blood sugar levels, they lose glucose in the kidneys. Yep. 
Um, so once it gets above about 10 or 12, the kidney, the... Um, That's millimoles per litre. Millimoles per litre. Millimoles per litre. Yeah. The glomerular filtrate is um, reabsorption process is overwhelmed. That's correct. And so anything um, above that just gets peed out, doesn't it? That's correct. And by losing that sugar, they have an osmotic diuresis. They also lose water. Yep. And by losing that water, they also lose the electrolytes that are freely filtered in the kidneys. That's and right. And that includes so. sodium. It includes potassium. It includes magnesium. Uh, and possibly, um, I don't think I've mentioned this, but also ketones go, disappear as well as um, even bicarbonate. So That is correct. So it just basically fl um, flushes a lot of the stuff out and you lose a lot of stuff. So you can get a whole heap of um, problems. So, and they get acidotic. That is so correct. The, the acidosis is primarily from the ketoacidosis. Yes. Um, and uh, they may have normal high or low plasma potassium concentrations on the initial diet when you initially diagnose them but the whole body is um, potassium deplete so the, the amount of you know potassium in your whole body if you were to add it up has actually gone down a lot um, so that's something to be aware of and we'll talk about that in a second when the treatment um, so these are the papers that I was um, referring to so uh, this is what we've we've referred to when we've put together this um, discussion about the management um, so there's a great article here on the BJA Education from 2016, and there's another really good one from last year um, in uh, this journal. So um, uh, if you're interested, follow that. We'll put the um, links to that on the on the website. So the principles of management. Uh, I'll get your comments in a second, Graham, but I think it's really important that you have the diabetes specialists um, involved in all aspects of these patients' care. They know diabetes inside out, and they are critical for the treatment. Um, it's really important that we, um, anyone who, who potentially has to look after these patients though, understands the principles of DKA and knows how to recognise it and um, understands all the um, pathophysiology so that we can um, um, get them the right treatment when they need it. And when they're really sick they definitely um, need to be looked after by a critical care specialist in an HD or an ICU environment. So it's really a team approach isn't it? Um, and they're going to need some monitoring of the mother because it's the mother who's unwell. But if they're still pregnant, they're going to need some fetal monitoring as well because they're presumably um, a really unwell mother who's severely dehydrated and um, got um, all these electrolyte imbalances is going to affect the fetal well-being. Any comments, I, Graham? I agree, Roger. <clears throat> um, so the four things that most of the management revol revolves around is their fluid uh, replacement, Potassium. I should chuck in there all the other electrolytes too. It's probably a, um, mag like magnesium, and um, I'm sure there's other ones. Um, making sure you treat the underlying cause, especially if it's a sepsis or something like that. And of course, um, they're going to need some insulin as well. Yes. Um, we're going to focus on the fluid therapy. So, in general, a sick DKA patient will have about six to a ten. You know, this is an average sized adult. Mm. Will have a six to ten liter deficit. So that's a lot, isn't it? Um, most of that is going to be replaced with crystalloid and most commonly that's saline um, but I did find there's a couple of recent um, uh, studies uh, done in ICU and um, uh, critical care showing that um, Hartman's or plasmolite is equally um, efficacious as long as you add some potassium so yes so the traditional treatment is saline with a quite a lot of potassium added to it often 30 to 40 millimoles in every litre and uh, Hartman's or plasmolite will not have enough potassium either, so you've got to make sure you add 30 to 40 millimoles to that. Um, there's some evidence that the acidosis is, um, resolves faster when you use these balanced solutions because Hartman's and plasmolite have um, lactate and acetate, which are actually um, bases, bases, and mm -hmm. they're used by the liver to manufacture um, bicarbonate. And uh, often what happens is it takes time for the acidosis to resolve because um, you do... Um, we out or urinate out uh, a lot of ketones in your urine and they, therefore you lose even though you've when you give them insulin over the next 24 hours the, the liver doesn't have those ketones that turn back into bicarbonate um, but it doesn't really matter what crystalloid you use as long as you keep a really close eye on the um, electrolytes so this is a this is cut and pasted from one of those um, papers that i was talking to you about before um, so i think basically you're trying to um, replace the fluid deficit over a sort of 24 to 36 hour period with the initial sort of half of the fluids being replaced so a bit more quickly than the um, second half. Yes. 
A safety mechanism with regards to administration of potassium, particularly in reasonably high concentrations, is to be um, reassured that the patient's uh, passing urine before right. adding um, extra potassium to the patient. Yep. Well, I think the next slide is going to talk about potassium, but that I think it's critical, and anyone who's unwell, I, I, rec I reckon they should be in an HD or an ICU with an arterial line, yep. so you can regularly, every, even every 30 minutes, but definitely at every hour or so in the first 12 hours, be looking at the blood gas and seeing what's happening and making sure you're not causing any um, serious problems. Oh, I'd have the potassium them. under doing it. Yeah, sorry, I'd have them on cardiac monitoring as well. Yep. When you're giving, you know, um, potassium at concentrations of 40 millimoles per litre over, you know, two hours. That's exactly right. Yeah. Hour. So there is potential for serious grief there if mm. um, if you're not careful. And so potassium, potassium. Sorry. Um, so fluid therapy. Not sure what I'm doing with the uh, uh, animations on the slide. That's right. So the average. Um, on average, the potassium replacement is required is about 40 millimoles for every litre of crystalloid. Um, and this is from the DK and pregnancy um, paper that I alluded to on the previous slide. So they have got a, oh, I think it's quite a sensible sort of um, easy to understand approach. So this is when you first di um, diagnose it. So they're saying basically if, um, if a potassium is over 5.5, give them insulin, but don't give them potassium. Um, so you've got to wait until the potassium's back in the normal range. Um, but even when the potassium is in the normal range, um, important to note that you've got to be giving them potassium. So any, uh, so basically, and then what have they got here? So and if the potassium is less than three point three, don't give them insulin. This is at the start, right at the start. Yes. Give them some potassium first, because what will happen is you start the insulin and the potassium will plummet mm. as as the potassium is driven into the cells. And what you don't want to cause is then suddenly discover the potassium is now one point five and they have a some sort of life threatening arrhythmia. Um, and likewise, you don't want to give them potassium. You don't want to give them potassium if their potassium is 5.5, and suddenly they have an arrhythmia um, because their potassium has gone to seven. Sorry about those extra sound effects. We had simultaneous uh, <laughs> for popular calls. people. Mm. All right. So the insulin therapy. Well, we're getting near the end here. So hopefully um, everyone will leave us alone. Um, so the first thing um, I've noted, it seems in the modern treatment regimens for DKA, the the classic um, sliding scale that I'm sure we've all heard of uh, is out. Uh, so variable rate infusions are out. So basically most um, treatment regimens now are fixed rate infusion of insulin. Um, and I think the main reason behind that, Graham, is that what have, used to happen was as the, um, dec as the plasma glucose got low, sometimes people would um, wean the insulin to very low levels or even turn it off, but that's the last thing you want to do because yeah. you need the insulin to turn off that catabolic process. Exactly, while well, you still have um, ketones circulating you um, haven't turned off the process of ketogenesis yep. and insulin is required to turn off the process of ketogenesis. Yep. So basically you have a fixed rate infusion, um, you know, 0.1 units per kilo per hour, some places 0.15. Mm -hmm. So that's about seven units per hour in an average sort of 70 kilo person. And and you keep that going even when the, and when the blood glucose gets less than 14, you just give them some dextrose. Um, but you keep the insulin going because we want to turn off that ketogenesis and you don't stop that and, and go back to either their normal regimen or their uh, or a sliding scale or some other um, uh, regimen which is recommended by the diabetes specialist until you have met these criteria which indicate you, the DKA has resolved. So the blood ketone is less than 0.6, pH back up close to normal of 7.3 and the bicarb above 15. Um, so that, yeah, so basically that, that's, that's the current um, philosophy in managing DKA with insulin. Would you comment on uh, urinary ketones as a criteria for resolution of DKA? Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that, I think. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So um, this is inter something interesting to know. So we've talked about the two type, main types of keto acids, the acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Interesting point um, to be well aware of is that the dipstick test on the urine is only sensitive to acetoacetate and often in DKA... Um, the ratio of beta-hydroxybutyrate is 10 times higher. So someone may be profoundly unwell with a very high keto, uh, ketosis, which is mainly beta-hydroxybutyrate, and only a tiny bit of acetoacetate. And so you do, you do a dipstick and it might only be 1 plus or even 2 plus of, on ketones and not look that impressive. Um, so what I was reading was that um, you should really use one of these... Um, um, Keto ketone monitors. I don't even know if we have one in our blood ketone monitors. Yeah, blood ketone monitor. 
I which guarantee we, which I'm not we, sure we don't whether we have or not. But that is what you should yeah. ideally be basing your um, therapy on. I guarantee we have them in the hospital. Yep, we'll have to, we should hunt that down, find that out. Yep. <clears throat> Okay, what about anesthesia? Um, so this is a little bit tricky. So sometimes patients, and they might be profoundly unwell, and ideally you try and fix their metabolic process, but what happens if they have um, emerg- need an emergency um, anesthesia, a cord prolapse, the baby has a fetal bradycardia, for example, if they're pregnant, or if they are profoundly unwell, they've ruptured an intra-abdominal organ and they've got um, an acute abdomen or something like that, you probably can't wait six hours and try and get their pH better. You might just have to crack on. So I guess there's just two things I wanted to bring up. If they are profoundly acidotic, beware the um, ventilator settings after you put them to sleep. So this person is profoundly acidotic but has hanging on by hyperventilating um, with a PCO2, oh sorry for those who can't see the slide, pH is 6.93 and the PCO2 of 10. Uh, You put them to sleep, make sure you have the ventilator up high. If you just stick it on um, 500 mils times eight breaths a minute, you know they're gonna become uh, exceedingly acidotic and that might cause cardiovascular collapse. And the other guess thing is um, they may be hyperkalemic, so this person's got a potassium 6.7, so it'd be probably good to avoid sucks. They're probably intravascular deplete. Yeah, that's right, yeah, so mm. you're going to need a bolus of fluid as well. Mm. So a whole heap of things to um, be aware of there. Probably it'd be a dice, dicey um, induction and an arterial line will be very useful just for um, cardiovascular reasons as well as uh, checking their um, metabolic status. Any issues if we used a regional technique? A probably quick, not. Quick, That's right. Quick so, spinal. so there is probably no reason you couldn't. Yep. The patient would be um, breathing a very tachypneic. Certainly for a cesarean, you, mm. could, you could do that. I mean, I guess if it's um, not uh, not a goer, you might have to convert to a GA. But if someone had, say, for example, a ruptured intra-abdominal organ, you're going to have to do a GA, aren't you? Yes. All right. Then another quick uh, thing, beware the mixed acid-base disorders. So that's why you should always check an anion gap. This is... Um, this is a patient who had severe hyperemesis. Um, so they have um, a metabolic alkalosis from the hyperemesis. They've been vomiting um, their stomach acid and losing chloride. So they're chloride deplete and they're hydrogen ion deplete. So that's why they've got a metabolic acid alkalosis. Um, and then they develop a ketoacidosis on top of that. So you don't get an anion gap in a metabolic alkalosis. If you've got an anion gap, that means you must have a, metabol- a, metabol- a metabolic acidosis of some sort as well. Yeah, and they've got limited uh, buffering with that's that right. low bicarb, or the low bicarb could be because of the compensation, but uh, yeah. That's right, yeah. We won't go through this one in detail, so I think we're dragging uh, on time, but mm. pause pause this um, slide and have a look at it if you want. pH 7.37, PCO2 of 32, potassium 2.7, Chloride 91, it's glucose a, 67. It's a very unwell woman. I um, can't remember where I got this from, but it is a real patient. Mm. Okay, sodium bicarbonate, it's out. Um, the only time you might consider it, I guess, is um, in a hyperkalemic crisis. But the treatment for ketoacidosis is um, the support of care and turning off that ketogenic process, not giving them sodium bicarbonate. What's the theoretical risk the problem of giving with, someone um, sodium bicarbonate? The problem with giving uh, bicarb is you're giving them more carbon dioxide, ultimately. Um, and so you're going to have to hyperventilate them in order to uh, clear that bicarb. If you don't do that, it will contribute to a, um, an intracellular acidemia and make their acidemia worse. That's right. So especially if they're ventilated and they, you can't ventilate them anymore, or if the patient is hyperventilating already and can't increase their ventilation, then all that happens is you're actually um, pushing CO2 into their cells, which is what really matters, and that makes them even more acidotic, so it's actually counterproductive. I don't think there's any evidence for it either. There's, there has actually been, I'd have to go back, but I remember reading in one of those review articles that there's been some studies on this and sodium bicarbonate and DKA. Um, I don't think it's even, doesn't help. It actually makes things worse. Yes, yeah. So definitely shouldn't use it unless you really have to. All right, we'll finish it there, I think. So um, anyone wants to learn about acid-based physiology and be a world expert, I recommend you go to the um, acid-based physiology section of anesthesiamcq.com dot au or dot com can't remember have a google uh kerry brandis is um tutorial there is amazingly um uh easy to read but very very um uh, comprehensive and deranged phys- physiology which has also got some stuff on dk and um, metabolic um, problems this is an icu uh, website um, from a guy called um, alex in uh, melbourne i think 
Um, how much do you think the uh, vet charged me for the um, Hartman solution for my cat when he had DKA? I, I, I you know would say he, told you. I'd say he would have put <laughs> quite a markup on, on the yes. product. I was um, pleasantly surprised to see it was only $132 for, uh, for the um, compound sodium lactate that he infused into my dying cat. What volume uh, did he give? I'm not sure, but a thousand mils would have um, certainly caused pulmonary edema in a seven kilo cat. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that one thousand mils of this costs a dollar dollar fifty to a dollar eighty uh, in our institution, uh, maybe suffice to say, I was a little bit alarmed at the costing. Maybe All right. maybe he had to use quite a few cannulas. Maybe that yes. was part of the price. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not sure if he drives a Mercedes, but he certainly with those sorts of pricing uh, manoeuvres, he probably does. It's called okay. critical care veterinary. <laughs> we'll leave it there. I should have done should have done veterinary medicine. Okay. Um, thanks again for listening, everyone. We'll call it quits. Uh, we'll call it, call it quits there. Great. Thanks, Roger. <laughs>